So Trent Robertson is the coach of the Roosters in the NRL, National Rugby League competition. He's won three grand finals in nine years and is starting to look like a, a legendary leader at the ripe old age of 43. Trent, thanks for joining us on The Switzer Show. No problem. Good to be here. Now, apart from you know, getting you know, to understand where you came from and your views on leadership and things like that, the big news story is that the NRL, uh, under the leadership of Peter Volandis, is trying to get up and take on the coronavirus containment policies by the end of May. What's the likelihood of this happening, Trent, do you think? So I think as we've found in the past, well, I was going to say the past couple of weeks, but daily there's been a change. Every couple of days there's been a, a shift in uh, whether it's been world thought or, or, or Australian or, or by state about what our policies are. So I think the important thing for us was to, to project a date, to set uh, an opportunity for us to, to plan and, and work towards that. But I also think the, the fact that people's missed the fact that we're going to be working um, with the health professionals to work towards that date. Now, I think... Uh, what the world looks like in six weeks' time will be very interesting for all of us. Uh, but I think the projection of it's a, it's a good start whilst working behind the scenes to do it in the safest possible way. It's come in under a bit of criticism from the Queensland Premier, amongst others. What would you say to uh, your colleagues down south with the uh, AFL? I mean, are they also, do you think, sort of working on plans like this? I think, I think all codes are working on plans. I think right across the world have been following sport. Everybody's working towards um, what happens, uh, how do they plan for getting their sport started again when it is possible through uh, government regulations. I think every, uh, every sport around the world is doing that at the moment. So we've worked it based on the New South Wales government regulations and I think uh, I think whether it's been New, uh, Queensland and Victoria have got slightly different rules at the moment, uh, and that's um, and that's good. It's, uh, they're, 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 we're all working through this at the same time. The only thing I'd say is that um, we're not uh, we're trying to get started in a way that is um, good for uh, the players, good for the mental health of, of our game, and also the people that love our game but we're not going to do fly in the face of what's right for the people. I think that's, that's been our discussions uh, with the NRL. Uh, do you think that um, Peter Volandi, who, you know, who's, who's clearly taken up the, the challenge to try and get the game back as soon as possible, has talked to government officials before you know, laying out the possibility that the game could be up and playing on the 28th of May? Well, I think... There's definitely been those discussions with government. I think, as you've seen, um, state government, New South Wales state government, uh, have been supportive about setting a date. And as I said, I think it's their understanding. What 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 happens is, um, as you know, people have to. We have to talk about today. The government have to stay on what is needed today, um, but then we also need to project for the future in, in sport. There's a lot of planning that goes on to open up a, a sporting code. Um, so I think the, the New South Wales government have been positive about us starting again uh, as long as we continue to trend in the right direction. Now, we'll uh, shift and move uh, if that changes, and as we should. If, if the medical advice changes in the next week or two or in four weeks, then we need to adapt with it. And Trent, what's sort of the, sort of the lead time that you as a coach need to sort of get your players ready to uh, take on a game? I mean, is it, is it four weeks, six weeks, even longer than that? Well, it, it changes because they're training at the moment. So in isolation, all players across the game are training on their own at the moment. Uh, and I think that that's, um, I think that's uh, a really good thing. But they don't have the contact is the big thing for us um, to be able to get the contact back in uh, to do that safely and then prepare for a high contact sport. The longer it goes, the longer it'll take. So if it does start on May 28, we could do that within three weeks. Um, if it does take longer, then we would need, you know, four weeks and then possibly five weeks to get to get them ready. But I would say anywhere between three and four weeks of team training uh, before we can start competition. 
So are you saying that you'd need three weeks before May 28 or you, if we started on May 28, the first game might not be until three weeks after? No, I, I do think that we'll need to get going uh, around the sort of the 6th of May, around that week uh, to get started on May 28. Um, so that, that's when your team would sort of come together and come together as a group and you'd be maybe in some sort of quarantine type environment, but uh, you'd be effectively, the whole team would be training. Is that right? Yeah, so I think that's, this is really important. Okay, so, um, the, uh, and I understand, like, it, the public opinion will be 50-50. You know, the people go, come on, I want the sport back on. And the people will say, well, why should rugby league start when other industries can't start? Um, and I understand both sides of the argument. I think for us, what we're saying is that we think we can do a really good quarantined environment. We're not, people think of the, uh, that it's, a, it's the stars that want to get the game back on. It's such a big industry and a lot of people, a lot of the average Australians rely on rugby league uh, as, as a job, as a way of life. Um, so I think that's important. But the thing that our industry has is we have two or three doctors that look after 36 players. So every single day, um, we have a doctor uh, at our environment that are that can put in protocols um, to quarantine and, and to, to best adhere to health regulations. And that's not possible in, in every industry. And we think we can do it really safely uh, in a way. And, that's, uh, and so that's what we'd like to do is to put um, some really safe precautions in, do it in the right possible way, um, but then we would have to do that for two to three weeks before we start training, uh, before we start playing. Now, Trent, you're the kind of person who, you know, you know I, I know you read business books and all that sort of stuff. So you're into risk management. Do you think the risk management could be done so that players are tested basically daily to see whether they've got coronavirus um, symptoms and anyone who, who had that could be eliminated and therefore you'd, you'd have a playing a competition, a competition of players that would be coronavirus free and as a consequence there'd be very little threat to the actual players? Yeah, I think we can create an environment that is um, very, very safe for the players. Now the ultimate would be to go into a, uh, like a, that bubble type arrangement where we're all, um, we've gone through a quarantine period, uh, gone into a safe zone and we start playing games. Now, the second question about that is how will the mental health of players be taken away from their families? So we've decided to deviate from that and create um, protocols where every day they come in, uh, they can answer questionnaires around um, what their, uh, how they feel and, and what their contacts have been. And then also um, uh, the temperature testing um, uh, and, and, and different protocols in our environment. So it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be highly safe uh, environment and we can't, uh, it'd be silly for me as a rugby league coach to say we can't uh, eradicate the risk completely, but I know through talking to the doctors that we can reduce our risk significantly compared to uh, me who lives in Waverley and walks around in, a, in a, uh, an infected area. I, I believe that the, the training environment will be safer than, than, than some people's areas where they live. So Trent, let's uh, move on to your other, your, we talked about business earlier, Peter, and uh, activities outside uh, football. What are the things that uh, keep you up at night away from football? So I, my, uh, my two, uh, my, my family and my work are the two things that, that are my daily uh, uh, joys. They're the things that I, I'm lucky to do a sport that is also a passion, uh, that also uh, would be a, a hobby of mine or and entertainment if I wasn't doing it. So uh, that, that, that they're two really important things to me. But I, I love uh, reading. Uh, and when I get the opportunity, my people have weekly hobbies. That, that gets put to the end of the year for me on through travel and, and experience. So, um, but I do enjoy yeah, reading and, and, uh, and discovering new things uh, is important for me to keep me active. Now, as I say, I know you do read business books and you clearly are in the leadership game because you are leading a group of young men and arguably the group of young men you are leading are millennials, which are regarded as one of the hardest generations 
in the history of generations to lead. Uh, and uh, you also got guys who are pretty heavy when it comes to testosterone and all those sorts of things. What, yeah. what have you learned about leading young people? Because a lot of people you know, watching this uh, and listening to this run businesses with young people. What have you learned about getting the best out of them? So there's a few things. The world's changed in the last couple of decades around choice. And I think we've all, um, there's, seen, there's been different talks and books and that written about choice and, and how important it has been uh, for all of us, but also how there's a tipping point, how sometimes we get too much choice. Um, uh, but in, in understanding that, so I started there because understand that these uh, young men or women have grown up with a lot of choice in life. Uh, and they want to have an opinion on on on, on what uh, the next decision they're going to make or someone's going to make for them, what, what that means. So so then if I go back to leadership, you have to understand what you stand for. People don't... Um, people... There's two things. They, they want strength and vulnerability. So um, people talk about being vulnerable, but you also have to stand for something. So people do want someone that is going to lead them, that is going to give them... Uh, give them a direction to go, but then they also want to know that you've got a heart at the same time. So that's, that's, a, that's a big part of it. And in that vulnerability, it is saying, hey, what, what's your opinion? Where would you like to go? Let's discuss different uh, opportunities for, um, for you, you to be heard. And when they have that opportunity, um, there's, a, there's usually a stronger direction that you take. The other thing about leadership, I think often people lead only in their personality type. This is a bit slightly different in uh, the way that people lead. So people will lead based on their style, which is really important. But you've also got to understand that you have to shift and move um, in different ways around your personality. So my personality will work for certain types of people. But if I understand that my... Uh, my personality type won't work for others. I need to be able to shift and move into different directions to allow uh, better coaching or, or better leadership to take place. And that does take some self-analysis to be able to know when to shift. I know in the book Rockefeller Habits, Rockefeller rec reckoned that if you want to lead um, children in particular, you give them a, a handful of rules and you repeat them very often. Do you find the same thing works well in a football team? Well, this is, we often talk about it. If you want to, if you want to get the, um, even the greatest creativity comes from rules. If you, want to, if you want to get someone to be creative, give them, uh, give them a couple of rules to lead by or to, to, to live by, and then their creativity will flourish. If you don't offer that opportunity, if you say, oh, well, you know, um, draw me a picture, then... They, they won't be as creative if you say, draw me a picture with uh, an X and two O's in it, then the creativity can, can flourish. So the same thing is people think that millennials want to, um, they want to have all the choice. So just uh, like have a really open arrangement. No, no, no. You've got to have some principles you stand by, some rules that you live by as a team uh, or as a person, and then your creativity can flourish off the back of that. So that's that balance between um, showing strength in leadership and conviction and also having enough flexibility to, to, to allow others opportunity to grow or to, to offer their uh, instinct as well. You talk a lot about uh, choice and I guess that probably means more collegial style of leadership but as the leader what happens when the choice your players want to make isn't the same choice that you want them to make? How do you, how do you sort of work that out with uh, when, when they want to go in a different direction to where you want, want them to go? So uh, th this is, there's a couple of ways to answer that, but I'll, I'll take one direction, whether it's on field or off field. There's a, there's a different one. If it's, if it's off field, um, sometimes you're wrong. So sometimes you, with either in a split second or over the course of a day or two, have to reflect on why, they, um, why they've decided to go in that way. And then you go back to a couple of, basic principles of your own and you either say, yep, I agree, actually, they, they might be right or no, 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 we're going to stick to this choice um, uh, and I've thought this out and, and off-field is, uh, is, is usually much clearer. On-field, um, you can guide them but they're, it's their subconscious talking. So often what they, they won't 
players won't sit at home and reflect all day like coaches will and come up with an answer. The best thing about asking a player about their on-field play, it'll naturally come out of them. And that's what, what comes out of them is their subconscious. And so in, in a game, that's what decides um, play. It is not something that they've gone in thinking about. It's something that's a natural instinct to them. So often what they say uh, is going to come out anyway. So you can decide to try and change direction. And sometimes you need to guide them. But I often allow a lot more choice on field around our strong principles that we've set up at the start of the year. And then the, the players can take you on a journey because they're much smarter than us. And, and, and the players presumably have to sign up to your principles. They're, they're, they're mutually agreed. Is that correct? Or? Yeah, so there's, there's the, the framework or the foundation work, which is often thought out by coaches, adhered to by players, and then it organically grows uh, over a period of time. And then they become one. The, the, like Jake Friend or Boyd Corder um, own and believe in those principles as much as myself and Craig Fitzgibbon as coaches. So they, 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 there's no, we don't, we, we all have ownership over them now. Uh, but then the way that the team plays on the back of that, um, um, Boyd and Jake uh, will have more choice on field than what I do. You know, my job is to keep them adhered to foundations that are going to keep them developing as a team and as players. But their growth is decided on the choices that they want to make on field. And because this is a, a national program, Trent, I must ask you the question because our Melbourne friends can be very anti or uninformed about the NRL. Is there an AFL coach that you've learned a lot from, um, you know, being a leader of footballers? Yeah, I've studied a lot uh, uh, of coaches. Now, two that I've, I've spent a lot of time with John Longmire at the Swans. We've travelled together. Uh, studied together, so I really um, there's a lot about the foundation of their their culture that I've really enjoyed talking to, um, uh, and that that was a, a big part of um, uh, yeah. The, we've, I've, we've swapped so many ideas over the last seven to eight years. It's been really enjoyable, uh, and I was lucky enough to spend some time with Bomber Thompson down at uh, Geelong uh, when Tom Harley was captain, and I really. Uh, completely different style of coaching. I really, uh, and I think he shifted just before I got there as well, um, but more of a creative sort of uh, open guy with the way that he coached. So I was really enjoyed uh, watching that as well. Mm. Well, Trent, thanks for joining us on the program and we wish you a lot of luck and uh, let's hope you can make it three in a row. That's the plan. Appreciate being on, guys. Thanks, Trent.